In this video, we will build out a video calling application with control buttons such as joining a room, muting your mic, or turning off your camera and then leaving and rejoining a room. We will build this application out with plain JavaScript, HTML, CSS, along with the Agora Video SDK. Agora is a platform that gives us tools for adding in video streaming, voice chat, real-time messaging, and much more right into our applications. This will be an oversimplified application to get you started and help you understand some of the basic concepts, but if you want to go beyond this video to learn how to build the same application with tools like React and even add in a full backend, make sure to subscribe because I will be adding those videos to my channel soon. Okay, so let's briefly summarize how this video will go before we get started. First, we will create an account on Agora.io where we'll need to set up an app and get that app's credentials such as a token, app ID, and a channel name. Then we will create a folder containing some HTML, CSS, and JavaScript along with the Agora SDK and we will write up some quick code to display our webcam footage to our website. Once we have successfully displayed our stream to our website, we will then add in some remote users so we can see other visitors to this channel. We'll then finish up by adding some controls and styling to our website. The source code for this project will be linked in the video description, so be sure to reference that if you have any issues. Okay, so the first thing you'll want to do is go to agora.io and create an account. Agora gives you 10,000 free minutes to use each month, so that should be plenty to get started and build and test your applications. Once you log in, you'll need to go into your console dashboard and select the projects tab. Go ahead and create a new project on file and fill out the basic information that's requested. For the authentication method, go ahead and select secured mode with app ID plus token. Once your app is created, go back to your projects dashboard to get your app ID and temporary token. If you created your app without enabling the secure mode for token authentication, you may see these icons appear in gray as opposed to blue. To fix this, select action and ensure that the primary certificate is enabled. Now, when you go back to your projects dashboard, you should see that your project is active. So go ahead and click on the key icon in the functions column to generate a temporary token, channel name, and to get your app ID. For the channel name, go ahead and add in any name you want into this field. I'm gonna use main at this point, so you can go ahead and stick with that. And once you have the channel name, go ahead and generate a temporary token to use. This token will only last 24 hours, so if you're working on this project over multiple days, you wanna make sure to come back and generate a new token, otherwise you're gonna see some errors because this token will be expired. In a production environment, we will wanna generate these tokens dynamically so users of our app can generate their own channel names to host a call. At this point, I'm just trying to show you the core concepts of how to make this application work, so what we're gonna do is generate these tokens manually from the Agora dashboard, but eventually I will be sure to show you how to do this dynamically by creating our own token server so users don't have to manually create these tokens. All they need to do is add in a channel name and the token will be generated. We're gonna configure our app with a temporary token, an app ID, and a channel name in a second, but before we do that, let's go ahead and create a folder somewhere on our computer. And in this folder, we're gonna want the following files. An HTML file, a CSS file, and a JavaScript file. In your HTML file, let's make sure we have our boilerplate tags set up, like our head and body tags. Make sure your CSS file is correctly linked up. And for the JavaScript link, let's go ahead and add this under the closing body tag. We have a couple of options on how to link up the Agora SDK. One way to go about it is to simply add in the URL and point directly to it. And another is to download the SDK by going to your Agora dashboard, select downloads and for the platform choose web sdks then choose video sdk this will download the file to your computer so we'll want to open up the folder and extract the file we need and place it directly into our project lastly i'll comment out the first link and we'll point directly to the sdk file that we downloaded now that we have everything linked up let's go ahead and build out some of the tags we need on our page First, I will add in a join stream button so our users can join a stream. We'll give it the ID of join hyphen stream. Then we'll create a wrapper to hold all of our video stream and our stream controls. The video stream div will be where we output each user's camera footage. And under the video streams, we want to go ahead and add in some control buttons wrapped inside of a container. Our controls will contain a leave stream button, 
a mic button so a user can mute and unmute their mic, and a camera button so a user can toggle their camera on and off. Okay, so now let's open up our application and let's make sure we have everything we need so far. Okay, so we're done with the HTML for now, so let's jump back into that JavaScript file and connect our website to our Agora app. This is where we'll use the token and app ID we created earlier. So in case you didn't save the credentials, let's go ahead and jump back into the Agora dashboard and we'll get the things that we need. Let's grab the app ID and paste this into our code. Next, we'll create a channel name and grab the newly generated token. And we'll add in the token variable here also. Lastly, go ahead and add in the channel name. I called mine main, so be sure you use the same name you used when generating that token. Once our credential variables are set, we want to use these values to create the client object. The client object is an interface for providing the local client with basic functions for voice and video calls, such as joining a channel, publishing our tracks, or subscribing to other tracks. Here we pass in the required properties, mode, which can be set to live or RTC, which specifies the optimization algorithm that will be used, and codec, which is the codec that the web browser will use for encoding. Below the client object, we want to set some values to represent the local video and audio tracks, along with the values to hold the remote user's video or audio tracks. Local tracks will store the current user's video and audio track in a list, while all other users that join our stream will be called remote users, and this will simply be an object. Let's create a function to toggle our local user to join a stream with their camera and audio track, and let's make sure this is an async function. In the function, we'll want to call the join method from the client object. This method takes in all our app credentials and adds our local user to the channel while returning back a UID. If a UID is not specified, one will be automatically generated, so setting this value to null is fine. Set the local tracks value that we created earlier to the return value of the create microphone and camera tracks method. This method will prompt the local user to access their camera and audio and hold these values inside of the local tracks variable. Once the video and audio tracks are created, we need to create a place to display and store our stream. Make sure that the parent container and child element both contain an ID with the UID value from the user because this is how we know which DOM elements to update. Once our element is created, we will query the video streams container and add in this new div into that container so it can be displayed. The local tracks variable is now a list which holds the audio tracks in index 0 and the video track in index 1. We'll query the video track from index 1 and call the play method which creates a video element and adds it inside of the HTML element which we specify by the ID value. Finally, we call the client.publish method to take our local video and audio tracks and we publish them so every user that is in this channel can hear and see us. Here we publish the audio track from index 0 and the video track from index 1. Once we create this method, we need to call it. For this, we'll create another function that responds to the join button click. So let's go ahead and call the function, then make sure that we hide the join button once we're in the stream. And also toggle and display our controls. And to trigger this function, we'll want to go ahead and add an event listener to listen to that join stream button. The functionality is ready to go, but we still have one last thing left to do. At this point, our video stream has no height and width, so even if it plays, we won't be able to see anything on our page. So to fix this, let's go ahead and go into our CSS file and add in some basic styling so we can actually see this output. Set the video stream's ID to a height and width of 90 viewport height and 400 pixels in width. Make sure that the video container has some height and visible borders. And make sure that the video player fills 100% of its parent element. The stream control should be hidden when we start, so let's go ahead and set this to display none. Alright, there we go. We have successfully displayed our stream. If the camera quality seems a bit off, it's because I'm really zoomed in and I haven't optimized any of the video quality settings yet, so this is all adjustable. At this point, we have successfully been able to connect to our audio and video source and publish them, but what about when other users join our channel? How will we see their streams and how will they see ours? For this, we have events that we can listen for and functions that we can fire off whenever these events take place. When we call the publish method inside of the join and display local stream function, this triggers an event called onPublish that other users can listen for. So this means that when any other user calls the publish method, all other users in that same channel can receive this call and use that data from this event and publish that new user's video stream inside of their local browser. 
Let's start building this out by creating a function that will fire off locally anytime another user joins the same channel that we're in. We'll call this function handle user joined and let's also make sure this is an async function. This function will contain a user and a media type for the parameters. So when a user joins, we will add them to the remote users object and set the key as their UID and then set the value to the user object so we can make sure that this is unique. We will also subscribe our local client object to the newly added user's video and audio tracks. So this is how we can receive their information. We want to then check the media type and respond accordingly. When the media type is video, I want to create a new video player and publish it. If the user already has a video player, we simply want to remove it and create a new one so there are no duplicates inside of our browser. Once the check is complete, we want to recreate a new HTML element to store the remote user's video track just like we did earlier in the join and display local streams function. Once the player is set, we again want to find the video streams div and append the newly created video player. Referencing the user object, we can access the video track attribute and call the play method to activate the video player. Add in one more check for the media type and whenever this is audio, go ahead and play the user's audio track with the play method. Now to trigger this function, we'll go back to the join and display local stream function and subscribe to this event by calling client.on and setting the event to user dash published and adding in our new function. To test this out, I'll open up my browser again and join from a few different tabs. Our app doesn't look great yet, but we successfully subscribe to remote users and those users can now join our stream so we can see each other. Let's fix this up a bit by going back to our CSS file and creating a grid layout so we can actually see these streams laid out side by side as opposed to being stacked on top of each other. In the video streams div, we'll go ahead and set display to grid and set the grid template columns to repeat auto fit min max of 500 pixels for the width of each column and one fraction as a max. So whenever we're in a stream alone, that stream goes to full frame and actually covers the entire screen. There we go. That looks a lot better, but we still have some work to do. Let's add in one more user and see what happens whenever three people join a stream and we should see it adjust to actually create a new row. There's going to be a slight issue whenever a user leaves our stream because we haven't told the website how to handle this event yet. If I close the tabs, you'll see we have these empty frames here. We want the website to adjust to this event, so let's go ahead and build that out. For this, we'll go back to our JS file and we'll create a function that handles what happens whenever a user actually leaves our stream. We'll call this function handle user left and the first thing we want to do is remove the user from the remote users object. Then we want to remove the video element from the HTML so the site can adjust to this. Last, all we need to do is add in this event into the join and display local stream function. Now when I test this, I can see the video frames disappear whenever a user leaves the stream. The only way for a user to leave a stream at this point is by closing their browser. Let's add some functionality to the leave stream button so users can leave and rejoin a stream at any point. Let's start with a function to handle this event by calling it leave and remove local stream. This should be an async function, so don't forget to add that. In this function, what we want to do is loop through all the tracks inside of our local tracks array and call the stop and close method on each track. The stop method will stop the video and audio track from playing, and the close method will close the track and release the space that that source was occupying. Once you call the close method, you cannot reopen a track. You'll need to create a new track. We then call the client.leave method. This officially disconnects our client from the channel. After we leave a stream, we want to make sure that the join button gets displayed again into the DOM so a user can rejoin a stream. And we want to hide the controls of the stream wrapper since we're no longer in the stream. Last thing we want to do here is add an event handler to the leave button to call this function. I'll go ahead and test this out by opening up my browser and joining from two different tabs. Here I have two streams open and when I click the leave button in one tab, you'll notice that the other screen adjusts once that user leaves. I can also leave and rejoin the stream at any point. Let's add another control by allowing a user to toggle their mic on and off whenever they want to mute their mic. We'll add another function and we'll call this function toggle mic. In this function, we'll want to check for the current status of our audio track and see if the mic is muted or not. If the current status of muted is true, we'll want to set muted to false to unmute and update the text of the button indicating the new status. Let's update the color just to make sure things are a little bit more obvious to the user. In the else condition, we just need to do the opposite of what we did in the if condition and just go ahead and invert things. If the mic is currently not muted, we want to go ahead and set muted to true and update the text and color. 
Last step as always, we'll add an event handler to the associated button to make sure this function gets toggled once we click it. Unfortunately, my screen recording did a poor job of capturing the audio test, but after a few claps, I was able to confirm that the button was in fact working. For the last bit of functionality, we want to be able to allow users to toggle their camera button on or off in order to turn off their camera without actually having to leave a stream. Back in our code, let's create another function called toggle camera. This function will look almost identical to the toggle mic function. We'll add a condition just like the toggle mic function, only in this case, we're going to get the index of one out of that array to get the video track. The muted keyword applies to our video track also, so we'll set muted to false to turn off our camera and we'll set it to true in order to turn the camera back on. When the camera is turned on, we want to update the text and the color of the button to help indicate the status just like we did for the mute mic function. In the else condition, we'll invert all the logic and update the text to camera off. Now all we need to do is add an event handler to the camera button and pass in this function and let's go ahead and test this. When I join a stream from two different tabs, I can see the result whenever the camera is turned on or off and it looks like all the buttons are working correctly. We'll jump back and forth a few times just to make sure everything's working from both tabs and it looks like it is. Now to finish this up, I want to add in a little bit of styling just to make sure things look good. We're done with all the functionality, but if you're interested in making sure this app looks good and you can show this off to your friends, stick around, we'll finish up all the styling and that's going to be it for the video. Okay, so we'll jump into that CSS file and let's go ahead and start by styling our body tag. I'm going to go through this part pretty fast since it's not the main focus of the video, but I'll make sure that you can pause wherever you need and see all the code changes. Here I want to set a background color for the entire page, so we'll set the initial background color in hex and then we'll add in a little bit more code just to make sure we can apply the gradient and set the direction. Let's move on to the join button which will need to be centered vertically and horizontally on our page and we'll give it a position of fixed and we'll make sure all the margins are set and the font is adjusted. In the video streams div, all I need to do here is set the margins just to make sure that this div can be centered. And in the video container, I want to set the background color so whenever a user turns off their camera, that space there doesn't look empty. We'll also update height to max height. Let's give all of the buttons tags on our website some styling so we can ensure all the buttons look the same unless otherwise specified. We'll remove the border, set the background color, adjust the text color along with the font size, padding, and margin. Let's also set the cursor to pointer to make sure things look a little bit better when we hover over a button. Last thing we need to do for styling is make sure that the site is mobile responsive. Since our video streams wrapper has a width of 1400 pixels, we'll set the breakpoint there and we'll adjust the grid columns whenever the width changes. At the 1400 pixels breakpoint, let's set the width to a percentage so we don't have any of the streams floating off of the screen. Oh, and let's jump back into the controls just to make sure all the buttons are centered and we have a little bit of margin on the top. Okay, I think we're all set, so let's try opening up our page and see what we have. Looks like all the colors are set, buttons look good when toggled, and the stream container has a background whenever the camera is turned off. That's it for this video, I hope you enjoyed it, and be sure to subscribe to see future videos where we dive deeper into this concept and we start building and deploying complete production-ready real-time video, audio, and messaging applications.